Welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian writers on their journey to publication. My name is Jamie Hirschberger, and I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Christina Katane, and I write multiple genres, including Christian dystopian fiction. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And if you like what we do here in the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, I'd like to encourage you to like and subscribe. That way you'll never miss an episode and uh, you'll be up to date on all of the fun happenings with us ladies, which brings us to our first segment, the what's up portion of the podcast, where we kind of go around the table and talk about what's up. Sadly, we don't have uh, Rhonda with us today. Um, she's taking some care of some things around the house and uh, personal things. I don't know how much she would like for us to share. So uh, nothing tragic or anything like that, but she's not able to join us today. So what's up with you, Jen? Well, this has been our very first week of summer vacation because my girls go to a, um, a balance calendar school, um, which we love, and but we love summer vacation too. So it's been really nice to sleep in a little bit and be at the pool a bit. And um, last night was a very beautiful night. We've had vacation Bible school all week and my girls came home and I walked outside on our back patio and it was beautiful. And my one daughter acted like she's gonna jump in the pool. And I'm like, go oh, get your suit on. I'm like, there are no mosquitoes out. Cause I planted a ton of marigolds this year in all of my um, on deck veggies. Like I have some herbs and stuff I have right on my deck uh, separate from my garden. And I'm like, oh, they must be working. So let's <laughs> let's swim. And I think that the, mos- the mosquitoes were listening and were hiding, waiting. <laughs> Just waiting because I jumped in, I got in and the water was so warm. It was like 80 degrees. It was so nice. So I got in and I thought, well, I'll vacuum up because our pool, the way that the circulation, there's always something in the middle. You vacuum it up and then the pool's Mm -hmm. super clean. So I get in, I get the thing all hooked up. Um, the vacuum and I go to start to vacuum me and they start attacking like my husband, my kids, or my kids are like, ah, so they run in the house. But here my husband and I are out there. We can't just run in because I had the vacuum all hooked up and we've got the skimmer apart to do it. So we had to like do all that up. By the time we came in, I was like, whose stupid idea was that anyway? <laughs> so, but it was fun anyway. It was nice to get in the pool. So oh it's man, been- and Michigan summer is beautiful. Mm-hmm. I'm really envious of you guys with your wonderful, mild temperature and beautiful, beautiful, green, uh, lovely Michigan summer. Just well, love that- it. That's a good segue into what are you going, what's going on with you, Jamie, in your summer down there oh, in steamy yeah. Florida? It is very steamy here, which I don't hate as much as I thought that I would hate, but it was so funny. So what's going on with me is that my husband is in town. He travels so much for work. It's really nice to have him home. And um, he actually came down a day early and surprised the kids. Of course, I knew he was uh, on his way. But so he's like, let's go sit outside because we're in Florida. A lot of the reasons, cause he really likes the hot, the heat. I'm just like, you know, I'm not staying out there if it's hot, but it was actually very nice this morning. It was, uh, it hasn't yet gotten to sweltery, bleh, you know? And so mm-hmm. it was really nice to sit out there with him and have our coffee together. Uh, that's always really a wonderful blessing. And so now the trick is to not be bleeding money. I mean, we live so close to Orlando. There's so much to do, but of course, every single thing you do, costs a whole big bunch of money. Right. And so like dragging five people around to do all kinds of fun stuff is all fun and games until you're like, uh, I think I need to get back to work. (laughs) So that's kind of what's up with us. We're looking forward to having a lot of fun and, um, happy enjoyment times while hubby is in town. So I feel like I'm late to the party here, but your husband's home. I thought you had to go pick him up the airport today. Yeah, well, he um, got into uh, the hub area of where he works and they didn't have any work for him to do. And there was like this gap of three days before his flight took off. So he was like, I'm just going to drive down because we had a vehicle up there. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, he just kind of blew off his flight and made the drive down because he couldn't wait to get home to us. So that's so nice. Yeah. And you messaged us and said, sorry, my hubby just showed up. I thought you meant he called. Because oh. like he, you know, so I'm, wow, that's awesome. I'm very yeah. happy for you. Yeah, me too. It's great. So what's up with you, uh, Bambina? Well, speaking of people showing up, um, my brother lives in Washington state, um, across the Puget Sound from Seattle. And he showed up <laughs> in Michigan for work. He had to come 
um, to Michigan. He's down, you know, like to the Troy Warren area uh, for work. And so we had dinner last night. We went Aww. to a nice restaurant and had dinner and closed the place down, I think. <laughs> it's so great. Tell, yeah, you have to tell me, the foodie, what you had to eat and uh, <laughs> if it was any good and where it was. Oh, we went to Blondie's. It's over on Hill Road by Meyer. Um, and it's that place that I went to get the General Chow's cauliflower. Mm. That's one of the things that are on there. Um, oh, you know, the stuff they bring out before your meal. Yeah. Appetizers. Think, yeah, appetizers. I just it's, early, it's early total still. Total brain fart. Um, and <laughs> they have really good salads. So I had like the Michigan Harvest salad where it has the little dried cherries and the pecans and stuff in it. And um, really good. They have a really good quesadilla burger. So since I'm diabetic, mm -hmm. I don't want that the huge bun that you usually get with a burger. So they actually put it on tortillas, like little small flour tortillas that they've grilled. And so their hamburger is between these two tortillas, which isn't a it wasn't it isn't like super low in carbs compared to a regular bun, but I just feel better after I eat it. <laughs> Like, you know, like after I eat a lot of bread, you kind of feel lethargic. The, the tortillas don't do that to me. So, um, so there's that. And then also I'm getting kind of excited for the fall for co-op to start back up because I'm teaching a class to uh, some of the homeschool kids on how to write a book. Nice. So I was, I actually was sitting here at my desk and when I finally realized it was two in the morning, I was like making an outline. Because I know oh, there are wow. tw there are twelve co-op meetings for the year, mm. so to break down everything into twelve weeks, and I was just like writing away at my little outline, and I was like, "Oh man, I got to go to bed." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's can I just wonderful. comment? Can I just comment on the fact that you are still upright? Like you went to bed at two a.m. and here you are. You were we, we start this at nine a.m. Uh, our behind the scenes. And like, can you guys imagine if it were me that were up at 2 a.m. and then had to be here? Like, I'm just very proud of you, Tina. You're so much better at that than me. I would be like <laughs> drooling out the side of my mouth, sitting here like this. I'm not good at Well, I got six sleep. hours of sleep, so. Oh, yeah, Jen, we want you with six hours of sleep. That's so mm -hmm. much more fun. I <laughs> or or being up for almost 24 hours. That's fun, too. We do need to do another episode like that where I'm like really groggy. No, I we don't. Do. <laughs> Jamie enjoys it. Tina's like, mm. and and Rhonda's like, mm -mm. <laughs> speaking of which, I haven't even been looking at chat. Rhonda's supposed oh. to be in chat. Oh my gosh, well, look at there's all kinds of stuff going on in chat. You guys, I'm gonna read a little bit. <laughs> okay, right. well, um, you know, I had have had sleep apnea that was undiagnosed probably for a couple of years, and I never really stayed in bed longer than six hours when I had it, and now I'm still in bed for six hours, but I'm actually getting into deep sleep mm -hmm. with my CPAP. And so like, I feel so much more energetic and I don't feel like my brain is in a fog. And You're so, so much more animated just interacting with you. Like you, you mm -hmm. move around a lot more. I don't know how else to explain it. It's really great. Like you can tell it's, it's so wonderful. I'm so happy for you that you've gotten some help with that issue. Yeah. It's nice not to feel like you're a zombie. All right. So if life. you guys uh, see my eyeballs going in weird places, it's because I have our little outline cheat sheet put on my phone next to me. So I'm going to take a glance at it right now uh, to just get my head in the space of the topic for today, which is another improve your craft um, segment. We're calling uh, this one improve your craft passive voice. Now, I am so sad that I just can't see our audience to ask for a show of hands of who has even ever heard of passive voice. Cause Jen and I were talking about the fact that um, we didn't really study it much in school or hear about it much in school. When did you guys first hear or learn about even passive voice? Like when was it even brought to your attention for the first time? Yeah. I think that there's an option in the chat to raise your hand. Ooh. Like you can put little hands. They're not in, I don't think so. Not that I can see in here, oh. but. Uh, Robin already raised her hand, so she's heard of it. She said, like, grade three. Grade three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, where did she go to school? And Maria raised her hand. She said, I've heard of it. Yeah, uh, Robin, where did you go to school? Well, I'm assuming Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I'm we really must have smart a better today. education system. But then, for those yeah. of you that are just tuning in, Robin and Maria are um, some of our super fans that are here every week with us, and so we've gotten to know them like yeah. like they're our besties. So um, we know a lot about where they live and about their husbands. And it's really great. So, so, um, um, but I just want to say, um, Tina did learn about passive and active verbs in school, didn't you, Tina? Isn't that what you said? Now I could have also learned it, but learned it for the test or something. <laughs> Well, I didn't I'm learn it in school. I learned it because I was the Bible study teacher. Oh. And part of my studying to teach the Bible study was to investigate the original text um, before it was translated. So that means in the Greek, if you're in the New Testament, and Hebrew, if you're in the Old Testament. So most of, the, most of what I taught was in the New Testament. So I started to learn Greek. I learned enough so that I can go look at the original text and kind of have a good idea of what it says and what it means. So in Greek, they have, instead of, um, like in English, we have the subject, the verb, and the, and the object, and the sentence is active or passive based on where you put your subject and verb. In Greek, the verb itself is either active or passive. Got it. So if it's active, that means whoever's doing the acting is acting upon the subject. The subject's being acted upon. Nope, that's passive. Passive verbs, the subject is being acted upon. And active verbs, the subject is doing the acting. Okay, so in English, in our language, you know, um, so if someone says that you've used passive voice, they are saying that... Um, the subject of your sentence is being acted upon. So the shoe was removed by the man as opposed to active voice where the subject is doing the action. The man removed his shoe, right? So in the first example, the shoe is the subject and it's being removed. In the second example, the man is the subject and he is mm -hmm. performing an action, correct? Right. And then if you have a subject and an object, it's the object is... Um the subject is before the verb, so I, that I'm the subject, if I start a sentence with I, that's an active sentence. I threw mama from the train. <laughs> so okay. through is the verb and mama is the object. I threw mama from the train. But if you said mama was thrown from the train by me, the object is in front of the verb and the subject is at the, after the verb, that's a passive, that's a passive voice sentence. Okay, so now that was like a whole lot of um, saying the word verb and subject. And I hope that the um, people are kind of getting the message of what someone means if they're telling you that your writing is full of passive voice, right? Because Tina, didn't you have an example where you went to uh, have your, you know, writing circle or something and, and you thought you turned in a polished piece and they're like, well, this is just full of passive voice. You're like, it's full of what? Right? Yeah, that was actually at our first writing group meeting. Um, when I submitted my prologue for the novel that I'm writing that I thought was like super polished. And then it was actually Rhonda's mother that said, this is full of passive voice. And I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> I, I was like, okay, I was just like trying to fake it. Right. Like, oh, all right. I think so we were I'm, all faking everything. Those first meetings we were all trying to put on our best. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, now sure. we're like so comfortable with each other. We're like, we would have been like, what? And, you know, I always got A's in English. Anything English, writing, creative writing classes I took, every, English 101, 201, 301 in college, A's. And I had no idea what passive voice was, so I was, like, really upset with myself. I'm like, how do I not know well, this? I never was taught it either um, that I can recall. Um, Barb, the person that actually brought that up to you, she commented in the comments that the first time she ever heard about it was in a critique group. So that's probably why she noticed it mostly in yours is because it had been brought to her attention, you know, as an adult as well. So, okay. So now I have a question for you guys and I, I don't even know if maybe we'll have to wait for Barb to answer it. <laughs> I'm not sure because we're going to talk about later um, instances where you might not care that it's passive voice, but how is it exactly a bad thing? So your piece is just full of passive voice. And so why not just turn around and say, so like, why is it a bad thing for your piece to be just full of passive voice? Why is that bad? Do you it slows down the action. So elaborate. So your reader's reading along and uh, you're telling a story. I threw mama from the train. 
Mama hit her head on a rock. Um, she was bleeding from her head. I had to jump off the train and wrap it up or, you know, well, if you threw mama from the train, you probably don't care, but you get my point. <laughs> okay. So that's like fast paced and it keeps your reader engaged and interested in your story. But if you do it the other way, mama was thrown from the train by me. Her head, when she fell from the train was, you know. Struck in upon a rock, I don't know. That's yeah, cool. struck a rock. Yeah. So those less like slower paced, and so here you have this high action being thrown from a train is kind of like a high action kind of thing. It would be like taking a fight scene from a movie and slowing it down to where it was just boring and it didn't keep you engaged and have you at the edge of your seat. And sometimes so, I feel like if there's an overuse of it, it can just read a little awkward. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know what I'm saying? The table was cleared. The dishes were washed. The cat was fed. Now, see, someone may choose to do that, like to be kind of poetic or something. But after, I don't know, 10 or 20 sentences like that, you probably just be like, this is really weird how it how it feels, you know, reading a bunch of stuff like this. Right. But the problem is when it gets a little bit tricky, um, which we'll address uh, in a minute. But um, how... So, okay, we'll talk about it now. How do you recognize it in your own writing? Because it's it's easy enough to look for was or were, right? That's one of the things in the notes. If you look for the words was or were, the table was cleared. Oops, there's the word was. Let's check this out. I cleared the table, right? That would be better. Mm -hmm. But how do you find it when it's like the tricky ones? You know, when you don't have the words was or were, and yet you still uh, are told that you have this passive voice going on. Well, for me, the answer is pro writing aid, mm. which is, um, it's just a program similarly, similarly, I can't talk, <laughs> similar to Grammarly. I think everybody's probably seen the Grammarly uh, commercials. They're all over the place. Um, and you put your writing in there and they have a tab for passive voice. So it, it, once I've looked for was, were, have, have, has been, had been like all those being verbs. You have a being verb. It, you have. You should check it and make sure it's not passive voice. Um, so the tricky ones, I use. I definitely use pro writing aid because I don't want to miss any. I think that brings up the pro writing aid thing. I think we need to have a future um, podcast on the um, our recommendations on apps and uh, different programs, because there's a lot of things that we over the years have tried out and we've kind of settled into what works for us. And I think that would probably be like really um, a good thing for our listeners to kind of hear that, but sorry, that was a rabbit trail. No, I think that that's a really good point, especially if it would be really funny if somebody who was a listener started to use one program that I recommended and one program that Rhonda recommended and Jen and Tina, and then they became kind of like a Frankenstein writer that was <laughs> <laughs> that was using all of our uh, suggestions. No, I think that's a really good um, point because we have brought up pro writing aid in the past and people may be like, mm -hmm. what? What are you talking about? OK, so um, a fun way that I discovered when I was kind of researching how can you find passive voice is if you change the ending of your sentence to by zombies and the <laughs> sentence still makes sense. Then it's passive voice. So <clears throat> the turkey was stuffed by zombies. Passive voice. Um, so you have a sentence. The um, the closet was decluttered, you know, by Aunt Susie and Jennifer working together as a team. So if you can change that to the closet was decluttered by zombies, passive voice. So it's really just kind of a fun way that you can find passive voice in your writing. You guys have Mama was thrown from the train by zombies. By zombies, yeah. No, it wasn't me at all, I swear. What a fun kind of game to play also. Yeah. But um, do you guys have a different kind of a clue, uh, other things that can clue you into the fact that you have passive voice in your writing? No, I don't. I wonder what Barb would say. Yeah, what would Barb say? Hint, hint, Barb what, in the what, chat room. What would you say, Barb? <laughs> I, I'm looking. <laughs> I do have a little note here. Um, when I went to uh, research this, wordcounter.net, the blog at that website, they say to identify passive voice, you should look at what happened and looked at who was responsible for doing it. If the person or thing responsible for doing the action is either omitted or occurs in the sentence after the action, then uh, that is passive voice. So that's very helpful. So 
if you know that a turkey was stuffed and you read in your sentence that the person who stuffed the turkey is not mentioned in the sentence or is mentioned after the stuffing happened, that's passive voice. I thought that was very helpful. Thank you, wordcounter.net blog. Which is really the same thing I said earlier about the about the subject being after the verb, mm -hmm. just in less grammarly language. Yep. And then um, if you look for, uh, it says also just what you said, Tina, if you look for any verb, the form of to be. So, um, oh, they use the, the past participle. And I'm like, what is that? So it says it's the form of a verb that typically ends in ed, removed, jumped, stuffed, um, that's, that's kind of a clue that you should look and see if you have passive voice going on there. Okay. So we can, uh, move on to how do you fix passive voice once you found it in your writing? What do you say, Tina? How would you fix it? Or Jen? Go ahead, Tina. Well, I would change my sentence around. Um, so I had knowing how to diagram sentences in this instance might be really helpful. Um, I love I'm, diagramming sentences. Can I just interject right there? I'm such a nerd. Raise your hand in the chat if you'd like to diagram sentences. All right, go ahead, Tina. Sorry. I'm yeah, so on my hand. If, you, if you don't know how to diagram sentences, like I was never taught that in school. I actually learned how to do that when I was doing Bible study so that I could diagram the like Paul's run on sentences. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you diagram the sentence and you, you move the subject, which would be I, in my example of throwing mama from the train, I is the subject. You put that before the verb, which is to throw in whatever form you use, and the, and the object, which is mama, after the verb, then you have an active sentence. I threw mama. Mm. Um, and you, so you can look at your sentences, and if you know what your subject, verb, and object are, you can change them around to make it an active sentence. Jennifer, I see you kind of smiling. Is there shenanigans happening in the chat? Oh, they're calling me nerd. <laughs> <laughs> That's All a cats, compliment. Ra Robin called me nerd. I, I responded with sentence diagramming nerd here with a hand up emoji. <laughs> uh, Rhonda's raising her hand along with us. She says, raising hand to Jen, all caps. And then Robin hates it. Um, uh, <laughs> they don't want me to show Rob uh, Barb's comment because they think there's a swear word in it, but there's not. So I'll show it That's because hilarious. she went, she went diagramming, pfft, but she spelled out pfft, and they thought it was a bad word. So, um, okay. Sorry. Well, see, I, I wouldn't say that I love diagramming sentences, but then I don't suppose I, it was explained to me as a useful tool in my writer's arsenal. I think when I had to do it, it was like, now we're going to learn how to diagram sentences. I'm like, why? Like, it just really seemed like something I had to hold my nose and get the A so I can move on. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that you're right. If you think about it as a tool to help you examine your writing, it can be very useful. So maybe that would change my mind if I revisited. And um, well, I'm kind of a math minded person. So to me, it was able, I was able, I love to write and I loved language arts. But then once they introduced me to diagramming, I was able to like put like mathematical equation kind of thinking towards my sentences, which I just totally ate up. And I agree with Tina, like then I think that's really when I started to learn how to structure sentence and how to write. And I, it was like a whole year that we had to do this all the time, my sophomore year of high school. And by the end of it, like, I think I was just a better writer. Like it just comes naturally to me, the diagramming in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and if you hate diagramming and if you want a little bit of help, Again, Pro Writing Aid gives you suggestions. Sometimes they don't, but a lot of times they'll give you suggestions of how to fix your sentence. Sometimes they just say, this is passive voice, consider revising. So Jen, um, I want you to speak to a little bit about, um, you know, when you should say, I know passive voice can be a thing, but I'm leaving it. When would that maybe right. be the case, Jen? Uh, and there's been some chat going on in our chat, some conversation, people like uh, Maria mostly asking, but can't you use it sometimes? And when do you use it? And I, that's what I'm here for in the conversation today is that, again, I think that, like I said last week, and I've said before on the podcast, you have to know the rules so that you can break them. Um, you can totally and absolutely use passive voice as a 
um, uh, for on purpose in your writing. But if you use it all the time, it won't work because then it just becomes like kind of lost in it. But times that I use it, and one specific example that I thought of when we started talking about this is that in my third novel, there is a stolen kiss that's in the past. And it's referred to um, a few times. It's kind of like as baggage that she carries around unnecessarily in my opinion, but she does. And so the the stolen kiss becomes almost like its own um, character in the story, but it's not a character. So when it's referred to sometimes, it'll be the stolen kiss was what drove her crazy or something like that. And like we've mentioned before, um, she is the subject. And so this is definitely a passive sentence, but when something becomes so important that it needs to take precedence in the sentence, that's when you put it forward. And if you take care of all the unnecessary passive voice in your writing, when you introduce something with passive voice, it's going to stand out and it's going to have more punch, which is what you want. So you're using it in a way that brings attention to that topic, like the stolen kiss. Um, there, I'm sure there's a gazillion other reasons that are topics you can think of. But ultimately, if there is something that you want to bring attention to and you want to like give it like a punch, then you can use passive voice that way to like almost in a poetic way. Yes, like a device, a writing a device. device. That's a word I couldn't think of. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. My mind went blank at that point. Yeah. And sometimes you just want to actually slow the action down. Yep. Yes. Um, and that's a really good time. I, there's been times where pro writing data said, this is passive voice, consider revising. And I'm like, no, it sounds good how it is. Every way I change it doesn't sound good. Um, it's too choppy because of your action's going too fast and you want to just slow it down just a little bit enough to give your reader a breather. Well, and I think passive voice works well. Flashback even onto this episode when I said, you know, the table was cleared, the dishes were washed, the cat was fed, and the whole mm -hmm. family sat down by the fireplace. Like now it feels like we are slowing down and kind of taking a breather. But um, that would be maybe the final chapter after, you know, the family has had this crazy day out. I hope this is not prophetic for my family. But anyway, so they've gone out and had just like a crazy um, experience out there. And then they came home and now we're slowing things down. And the passive voice kind of helps with that. Um, yeah. And Jose, again, we're back to, oh, sorry. That's okay. Go it ahead. goes back to if you know the rules, then you can break them, right? So as writers, there are going to be times that you're in a critique group or you have an editor that's going to say, you need to fix this, this, and this. And there will be times, and Jamie and I have gone through this because Jamie was my editor for my latest book that's coming out very soon. Have a, have a reveal tomorrow. Um, there were t Most everything Jamie said was spot on. She's a great editor. If anyone wants to hire her, she's really awesome. But then there were times that I was like, no. As my writer, in my voice, this is how I wanted it worded, and I'm going to keep it. Because there are times that I would use either passive voice, or sometimes I would um, um, do things that, not head hopping, but things that seemed like um, like I should make it in more like like a in dialogue in his head. I just didn't want to. Like, nope, this is how I want it to read, because uh, it's my writing, right? So you learn the rules so that you can break them occasionally but you don't want to break them all the time. If you're, like I said before, if your writing is full of passive voice, then it's just going to read awkwardly. It's not going to feel good when we get to those few things, like what Jamie was saying, the cat was fed, the dishes are washed, and then you you can feel the difference. If it's full of passive voice, you're not going to feel the difference, right? No, and it's going to it's gonna read really slow, like Tina pointed out before. All right, so do we have any more uh, from the chat on passive voice or do do you two have anything that you want to add about it? Because it's getting to be about time where we transition to the next segment. So last call for chat on passive voice. Barb says, my opinion, not wrong to use it, just important to know when you are using it. Cool, yeah. Agreed, yep. Definitely. thumbs it up. All right, so we're going to transition now to the feeding of the bags. What? Oh, goody. What is that? Okay, mm -hmm. so we it's a long running joke where you know we ask for feedback on our piece, and then after someone gets one, we say, Is your back well fed? And so we call this the feeding of the backs. Now, what happens on the podcast is we take 15 minutes before we go live and we do a, a word sprint. We set the timer for 15 minutes and we just write, write, write. This week it was 15 minutes and 30 seconds. I won't say who requested the extra 30 seconds, um, but I was happy to have them. <laughs> <Jennifer>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't have an emoji here, so I just have to actually raise my hand. So yeah. Um, anyway, so we had 15 minutes and 30 seconds today, and we all wrote, um, Jennifer, I like to make you go first, so why don't you tell us what the prompt was, and then you can share your story with us. I just want to say, oh, Gina's now oh. on chat. Oh, but I wait. Just before we do that, I just want to say that because we didn't edit any of these pieces and we only took 15 minutes to write them, we give positive feedback only. So if you want to see how we would really critique something. So if there's passive voice in Jennifer's story, none of us are going to say anything about that now. But if we were in our postcast, which is our Patreon subscriber only access website, we would slow down and say, okay, Jen, I don't know if you were aware that you had passive voice in paragraph two. I don't know if you realize that you've got the word... Uh, uh, ambrosia used twice close together in this paragraph, whatever. But if you want to see how we really critique pieces, the Patreon is the place to be. It's only $2 a month and we're usually on there every week. No postcast this week because we just didn't have the heart to do it without Rhonda and other reasons. I thought I was going to the airport, whatever. But the point is $2 a month for four episodes of great critique to help you be a better critique person giver and receiver. Okay, Jen, sorry about that. What's up? Plus, plus you get like peaks into our writing because what we're bringing to this stuff is just kind of fun and occasionally it might show up in our writing, but the postcast stuff, that's straight out of like our novels that yeah. you're going to be able to see someday. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of fun inside thing. Good point, Jen. Um, yeah. Also, if you do, if you did do the sprint or you decide to do it right now, please do screenshots and tweet them to us because we'd love to retweet those and share them with everyone else. It's a lot of fun for us to read your writing as well. Okay, so here it goes. Not really 30 seconds extra of quality, but it's all right. <laughs> okay. I do like this piece. It's kind of fun. I wrote in Rhonda. I wrote in first person in present wow. time. But yes, this is. Uh, and as I'm doing it, I'm thinking, Rhonda's going to so love this. <laughs> all right. What's the secret to a happy, successful life? I blink several times, absorbing the fact that this very adult, very, wor very well-worded query came from a five-year-old. Because, come on, let's admit, that was yeah. kind of a... Yeah. I totally thought so. Too. You forgot to tell them what the prompt was. Oh, let's start over. <laughs> let's just back up like I didn't just do that. That's fine. And I will pull up the. Um, I just don't want anyone to be confused. Like, what is. Yeah, because I think that we're confusing enough without that. So, well, I all agree right. with you before you read it. Yes, it did seem a little bit weird to me also. So, right. Okay. Right. So, here, here it is. Um, and again, we're getting, we got this one from, I love this little book. It's 642 tiny things to write about from the San Francisco writer's grotto. Nice. Um, it's just little, sometimes it only takes like two sentences, but like we pull some things out of there because it's fun stuff. Alrighty. Who's ready to sprint? Here's today's prompt. A group of kindergartners ask you the secret to a happy, successful life. What do you tell them? And are you living that way yourself? Ooh. That was our prompt today. And here. We're going to act like I just started reading it for the first time. <laughs> What's the secret to a happy, successful life? I blink several times, absorbing the fact that this very adult, very well-worded query came from a five-year-old. That's an interesting question, I say, stalling for time. What is the secret to a happy, successful life? I guess I never thought about before entering the classroom, this classroom full of kindergartners. I had expected questions about my favorite book or how much money I make, maybe, but nothing quite so existential. Yeah, the toe-headed boy continued. I mean, you're successful, right? Doesn't that does that make you happy? Well, I am happy, and I guess success is measured differently by different people, I mused. Even though I knew that most of the publishing world would not see me as successful with my one published book and one book on pre-order profile, hint hint pre-order. <laughs> but I was also pretty certain that there were plenty of other authors, writers just beginning their journey and still in the dreaming stage of their career that would lo love to experience my level of success. So what's your secret? I looked around the room at all the small faces, eyes glued on me, a giant in their eyes, no doubt. Then I looked at their teacher, my friend, and saw the dread cross her face. She knew what I was going to say. And as a teacher in a public school, she was terrified. But down deep inside, she knew I had to say it. This, this truth I was about to reveal was as much a part of me as was my hair color or my gender. There was no concealing it, and I wasn't about to deny it. I looked back at the little boy, boy and smiled genuinely. My secret is Jesus Christ. I don't find my happiness in my career and success or anything else in this world, because then what would happen if I lost all of it? 
What if I never sold another book? Would I have to be sad the rest of my life? And I've had times in my life where I wasn't successful. And you know what? I was still happy because I chose to be happy. I chose and I still choose Jesus. The little boy smiled the biggest grin I'd ever seen on a face that small. I chose Jesus too. The rest of my visit was taken over by this little blonde evangelist telling all of his friends who Jesus was and how Jesus lived in the little boy's heart. As I picked up my books and placed them back in my bag, I smiled at my worried friend. Don't worry, I said. But what if my boss finds out about this? You did nothing wrong. The rules about sharing religion only apply, only apply to you, not your students. Besides, I don't think the principal wants to go up against this little guy. He's no match for him. Three, two, one, 30 seconds before. Okay, Aww. so now on to the accountability corner, since you gave like the best answer. <laughs> and now like no. mine seems so like, I don't want to read mine now. So we're oh, going to, no, no, but really that was really good, Jen. And yeah. um, I really appreciate that answer to that question. And good that you still answered it in the form of a story because, you know, it was mm. really kind of an autobiographical question. Right. Um, what did you do, Bambina? Did you also tell a story or did you go autobiographical on it? Well, um, I have decided a couple of weeks ago that every time I do a sprint, I'm going to do it in the same world because I'm thinking about my next, what I'm going to do next when I finally get my novel done. And I've been writing in this fantasy world. So I was trying to decide how, um, my character in this fantasy world that I've been writing in would, you know, what would happen. And so she doesn't get to ask the question directly, but kind of. All right. So before the question, we hear it, so. um, what else can we say about Jen's piece? I love blonde headed evangelist. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I liked how your character, you know, very much recognizes that she's no giant in the rest of the world. But, mm -hmm. you know, you get that little like magical cape whenever you go into a room full of littles and they look up at you and they think that you're the best. So you right. totally captured that. That was really good. Yeah. yeah. So, so there is a little bit like this didn't happen obviously, right. but there's so much of this that is so real to me because I used to be a teacher and I have, you know, a lot of friends in the teaching world. I had friends that were principals and one that went to my church. We didn't work at the same school, but um, I remember in Sunday school mentioning something that had happened in my classroom and something I had commented on in a Christian way. And he's like, aren't you worried about losing your job? Like he was so like freaked out for me. And I was like, God gave me this job. I guess he can take it away if he wants. That's how yeah. my attitude always was. I, I always was super open about my relationship with Jesus because I thought, let God take this job because I really like need to be home with my kids anyway so um but yeah so like again like the them looking at you like you're like different than what in inside you feel I'm like i am nobody like that's yeah. so real to me yeah mm -hmm. awesome all right it was so really good back, i liked it well fed jen i do very feel very well fed thank you all right awesome let's see what bambina came up with for this prompt okay let me just open it up here and make it bigger because i don't i can't see it Oh, yeah. Life after a certain I... age is such a joy. With the oh, my gosh. And now it just closed. Uh-oh. <gasps> well, do you want me to read mine to kind of fill some time for you? Um, well, I think I can get it back really fast. All right. So let's take this time to say that we won't be broadcasting next week. It is the 4th of July, and we all have... Uh, stuff going on with friends and family. I know we were here for you on Thanksgiving, but that was just because Jen and I are a couple of turkeys and wanted to uh, share the holiday with you. This time, um, we are going to be too busy out there doing stuff away and from the year, So, And the, for those of you outside of the U.S., the 4th of July is actually, you guys have the 4th of July as well, but you don't have Independence Day. Like we call it the 4th of July, but that's our <laughs> National Independence Day. And that's it's a right. big family day. And um, my two stepsons are both going to be home and my and my daughter-in-law, which hasn't happened in years to have them together. So um, I'm taking actually the whole week off of office hours and everything and just going to enjoy, bask in the glory of having my kids. Yeah, around. and you know what you need to do? You need to wear that same shirt, but then get yourself like a navy like thing to tie up in your hair, like a navy bandana yes. or tie it around your neck because like the, with the navy and that red, that'd be just really mwah. Perfect. I need to do my hair up like in those rosy, uh, the yeah, riveter. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, I'll do that and send you a picture. Yeah, take a picture yeah. and post for it. For you. Okay, Jen, you got, uh, you got your story for us, Tina? Yep. 
right. Yep. And uh, for our one uh, listener in England, it's the rebellious colonial day. <laughs> 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 yeah, Maria. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. How in the world did I get myself into this? Tieran wondered as a. I'm sorry. I totally messed it up. How in the world did I get myself into this? Tieran wondered as a throng of small girls clamored around her, trying to touch the leather armor she wore. It was made of dragon skin, and the scales glimmered in the sunlight, flashing different colors depending on how she moved. To an enemy in a battle, it was extremely disoriented, disorienting, but to this cluster of five-year-old girls, it was fascinating. Did you kill the dragon it was made of? Asked one little girl with pigtails the color of straw. No, this armor was made long ago and handed down through the ages by those who came before me, Tyrion replied. I want to be a warrior princess when I grow up, said another little girl with long dark hair and blue eyes. She stood with her hands on her hips and her chin in the air. You'll be a great warrior princess, said Tyrion with a chuckle. The little girl narrowed her eyes at Tyrion. Why did you laugh when you said it? <laughs> I am going to be a warrior princess no matter what. I don't care if you believe me. I wasn't laughing at what you said. Tyrion tried to keep her face serious. I was just remembering when I was what I was like at your age. I have no doubt you will be a warrior princess. And that's what's, if that's what you've set your mind to. I'm sorry, I lost my spot. The girl's face softened and she came over to sit beside Tyrion. Is it wonderful? She asked, gazing off into the sky as if she could see her future there. Parts of it, Tyrion replied. But parts of it can be very lonely and frightening and being brave all the time can make you weary sometimes. You know, I'm just a little kid, right? You shouldn't say things to try to discourage me. You should only tell me the good stuff. <laughs> Tyrion wanted to ask her if she was sure she was a little, just a little kid but didn't think the girl would appreciate the irony. Tell me what dragons are like, the little girl asked, her eyes wide with excitement. Have you ever talked to one? What did he say? Well, said Tyrion, let me tell you about the first time I ever saw a dragon. I was, set, I was sent on a journey up the great mountain by an old prophetess named Giselda. Giselda. It was a long and arduous journey. What's arduous, asked the girl. Three, two, one. Oh, so good. Oh, is there any way this little girl can get her own little pony and just follow Tyrion around like for the rest of the book being annoying? Because it's so awesome. Uh-huh. I love this kid. I agree. Yeah. And I, I know really, I might write the story about her instead of Tyrion. <laughs> I know. I really love the rainbow scales. Oh my word. I love that whole idea of dragon scales being iridescent and, and uh kind of having that weird effect on the enemy. You know, that's really kind of neat. And in fact, it because I know this story and the history of it and her her coming out of a battle and being like, what just happened? Like, maybe there could even be a moment in the battle with that particular shield and the whole reason why she was able to get away or something. So anyway, I thought that that was a really nice touch to the whole world that you're building there. Thank you. In our chat, it was asked of whether or not this this ever makes it into your stories when we do these. I kind of answered for you, but um, you want to go ahead and answer that out loud too for people to know, like when um, you do these friends like this in our worlds. Um, well, this one, I, it's a book I have. I'm kind of looking in the future to writing, and so I'm just every time we have a writing prompt and we do our little 15 minute sprints, I'm trying to write in that world. So when I do sit down and actually think about seriously writing the book and making my outline and stuff. I'm going to have all these sprints to draw from and I'm already going to know my character. It's well, really a tool to know my character. And can I just point out that this is now a book, but it started where Tina had uh, seen a call to submission and she uh, was trying to write for the call to submission and it just grew and grew. And now it sounds like it's a book in her future, correct? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you never know where inspiration is going to come from. The submission had to be less than 6,000 words, and I just don't know how I'm going to fit the story into less than 6,000 words. Um, yeah, well, my so submission we'll was supposed to be 1,500 words and ended up as a 45,000 word <laughs> novella. So this could be a future, this could be a future book. Yeah, so always yeah. explore those little mm -hmm. uh, strange opportunities that come your way. All right, so um, 
without for is your back well fed tina oh yeah yeah all right so i'm going to read mine without further ado which has a very similar opening to yours tina oh good how had i let myself be talked into this i <laughs> stared down at the group of five and six-year-olds sitting cross-legged and expectantly on a on little carpet squares i rubbed my hands against the rough fabric of my coveralls still so new as to be covered in a pattern of rectangle shaped creases they are just for show, after all. My wife forced me to wear them. I typically wear jeans and a t-shirt on my job as a garbage man, or as the kindergarten teacher just presented me, a sanitation worker. I tried not to be offended by her attempt to fancy up my job title. After all, the garbage part of garbage man was what had brought me to the career. I loved everything about garbage day from the time I was a small boy. Every garbage day, I'd, I'd drag my little blue plastic chair to the curb, my mom insisting I set it on the other side of the driveway for safety reasons and wait with my curious George plush in my lap. Soon the sound would reach my ears from way up the street, the hiss of the air brake and the low rumbling engine of the truck revving up as it made its way up and down the street in its stop, start, stop, start rhythm. I'd strain my eyes to get the earliest possible glimpse of the big uh, I got a typo there, of the men with big muscles and big smiles as they made their way up the street toward me, heaving the cans and then hitching a ride on the back of the magnificent truck. They would greet me as they hoisted our cans. Sometimes mom had lemonade or water for me to give to them, which they always received with many thanks. Now I stood before a group of kids already feeling like I'd allowed their teacher to apologize for my career, for what I was. I tried not to think about that, tried to catch the eye of some other eager little boy in the audience before me, excited as I had been about the big noisy truck and the happy, sweating, muscle-bound men who worked alongside it. I knew I wouldn't catch that excitement in the eyes of my little princess, who was proud of her daddy in any case, but who would just as soon not see me after work until I'd had a long, hot shower. She gave me a little wave and I smiled. Then the teacher began with the questions. Did I like my job? What was my favorite part of the job? Then the children were prompted to ask questions. Does my work make me stinky? Do I see many bugs? I answered them all cheerfully enough, but was still waiting for that one kid, the one with the spark of interest I knew I'd possessed at that age. My hopes rose when a head lifted in the back of the room and his hand came up alongside it. I wondered what in my answers had drawn this child out of his shell. <clears throat> the teacher called upon him and he asked his question in a small, clear voice. You seem so happy. What is your secret? The teacher looked at me red-faced and apparently embarrassed by the question. I shook my head slightly at her and beamed back at the boy. Son, I've been doing work I love, hard work. It exercises my muscles, it makes me sweat, and makes me good and ready for my dinner and my bed each night. The kids were all staring, more intent on this answer than any I had given before. You find yourself a purpose like the one I have feeding my family, keeping them well cared for, and a means to fulfill that purpose, and hopefully in a way you actually enjoy, and their son, I believe you will find happiness. The boy nodded. I glanced at the teacher and was surprised to see her wiping her eyes. Yay, daddy, called out my princess, starting an enthusiastic round of applause on my behalf. Yay, I love that. Why did you not want to read that? That is so good. Because you're like, find your purpose in Christ, which is the ultimate oh. right answer. Do you know what I'm saying? It's kind of yeah. like, oh no, don't find your happiness in a job. I'm like, well, that's true. <laughs> no, well, yeah, but I mean, like there's different parts of our happiness, right? Like we do yeah. need to find a job that, that makes us happy and that like you feel, like feel fulfilled in because yeah. that's part of God's purpose in us too, is because God calls us to different things. You know, sure. like that God doesn't call all of us to be writers. Um, and just like, he doesn't call all of us to be pastors from a pulpit, you know, like mm -hmm. he's got, we need to reach everybody and everybody isn't in church. Everybody isn't reading books. So I just, I love that. Well, I'm so glad. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I'm getting really into descriptions of being a garbage man. I don't know if I'm ever going to get around to this question. So I'm like, tippy, tippy, tippy. <laughs> type really fast because I'm like, I haven't even touched the prompt yet. What in the world? You know, because so, <laughs> you're getting was, so much into the character already. Like, you already knew him. I feel like I feel like well, I know him now. Tina knows him a little bit, don't you, Tina? Because uh, yep. I had a word uh, mm. prompt earlier in the week based on those words I wrote about garbage men. So it's kind of funny because uh, it's like more of, the, although I don't know if, which guy this is, right? This could be our original guy way in the future, but he didn't seem very excited about being a garbage man, did he, Tina? 
You know, he was a trainee and he was finding out that the truck he was going to be really working on had no air condition. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it might have been his other guy, the guy who was uh, training him. That's probably his. Yeah, name. maybe. All right. I, so I, when originally, he, I thought when you started talking about garbage, I thought, oh, she's bringing about her husband. <laughs> he loves garbage. We had this conversation. We've never, we've never talked about it on air, but it's like a holiday. She said, she, according to Jamie, tell us oh. about Stasha's love of garbage. Oh, day. he gets all excited the night before. Well, tomorrow's garbage day. Well, so we called garbage day the day you put the garbage at the curb. So we say it's garbage day, right? So mm -hmm. we go all around the house and throw away everything we possibly can. Now, see, when he's out of town, it's kind of like, well, it's garbage day. I guess, you know, the bag that's in the kitchen and the stuff that we've taken from the kitchen. But no, my husband is like, sweep the premises. You know what I'm saying? So he's like, so happy about it. Yes, he's so jazzed because I think he feels so good about just getting rid of stuff. Like we all know taking that bag to the Salvation Army or whatever is so satisfying. And I think he loves it. He gets to have that feeling every week. And happy day in florida we get garbage day twice a week so it Ooh. is like a double yeah so i tease him and i i'll show him a picture of the garbage at the road and i'll send him a text that says happy garbage day <laughs> <laughs> thinking of you I, this garbage day like what you would send for christmas or whatever. i feel like our husbands would be really good friends <laughs> you know Stop. it, it took me five years of marriage to convince him that we didn't have to throw away the artificial christmas tree every year <laughs> And oh. on, on Wednesdays, I, I worked as a medical assistant in the doctor's office. And on garbage day, I'd be backing my car out of the garage and turn around like to get back into the road. And there would be my cat's crate sitting on top of the garbage. <laughs> and I had to get out of the car and get the crate and put it back in the garage. And he, his thing was like, well, we never use it. Why is it here? I'm like, look, the once a year I have to take the cat to the vet, I need that crate. If you would like to take the, the cat to the crate that yourself with no crate, I welcome you <laughs> to do so. <laughs> I need the cat's crate. That's awesome. Well, yeah, Stash, he loves if you're to throw things away. Stash, if you're listening, I just want you to know that whenever it's garbage day, I think of you as well. But you're like skipping around and like twirling <laughs> ribbons and stuff. That's how it is in my mind. So you're welcome, yeah, Stash. That's hilarious. He's, ribbons. he's really not a skipper. I, it's so <laughs> I know. That's what's that's so funny what makes about it. it even better. You know what I mean? I okay, so guess but what? But he is yeah. a ribbon twirler. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. So my coffee. I am really enjoying this topic, but we have seven minutes approximately to get through our accountability. So just a couple of minutes real quick. Everybody talk about their goals, how they did this past week and what's coming up. Uh, Jen, you're having vacation, aren't you? So let's start with you. What's going on? Okay. So next week, I'm yes. But as far as office hours, I'm having vacation. Um, I still have to keep working because as I hinted at during my writing, my um, book is coming out soon. Uh, the actual the official date of release is July 18th, but the ebook is on pre-order everywhere. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, anywhere, Kobo, anywhere you can think of, the, the ebook is on pre-order if you want to go over there and check it out. And tomorrow is my official release of the cover, which I guess I probably shouldn't put the book on pre-order because if you want to cheat, you can go and see the cover. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> no, but, um, yes. Things are happening. So um, I got the the actual um, proof copy in the mail and it is with the proofreader right now doing all the final like polishing up to see if there's any missing commas or quote marks and then we're ready to rock and roll. So um, next week I'll be doing social media stuff and still trying to write a little bit every day, but mostly vacation for me. Okay. So I just wanted to bring your attention to that. You have a deadline on July 15th to have your Christmas story um, finished. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want you to not to back burner that and not have it kind of swirling around up there with all the rest <laughs> that you right. have going on. I um, know. Because that's going to put you with about a week to have that finished um, up. So how do you feel about that? You feel okay? Yeah, I'm feeling okay about it. Right. Um, I've decided to pick, remember, you guys know that I was not liking the story and I yeah. kind of tore it all apart. And then I was sitting with my friend Lauren yesterday and telling her about it. And I was, as I'm telling her, I'm realizing there's too much going on in this story. Like for me to keep it to, you know, that was the problem. I'm so used to writing full novels. And so we talked it through and I, I'm pulling out a huge plot point and I'm just going to use it in a different novel. And I think it's going to be so much easier to read and so much better because it's just a short story. Like it's not supposed to be a full on novel. So I think that was my struggle. It's, you guys know, it's hard for me to write short anyway. So, but it'll be, it's going to be much better now that I've done that. 
Awesome. So we won't see you until a week from Thursday. What do you, what is your goal for? Let's see. That would be the 11th. To have the, uh, well, by the 11th, um, I pretty much done editing the um, Christmas uh, novel. I need to have um, things set up for my um, book release. Um, I need to have begged Jamie to be there for the book release party again, like last time <laughs> to be my co-host. Um, so yeah, basically I'm going to be writing every day a little bit um, and have, and staying on track with the book release stuff. It's going to be job. a lot. I've, I've been working a ton in, uh, I started some advertising and I, so I've been doing a lot of like business side of writing. Like I've been working hours. I know you guys haven't really seen that, but I've been working hours every day this past week. So um It'll be a lot of that stuff that doesn't show up with like, here, look at how much I've written, but it's a lot of time spent on graphics and behind mm -hmm. the scenes stuff. So that's yep, what that's I'm doing. all important too. And yep. uh, the point is to spend that time on your writing career, whatever that looks like. Um, I'll yeah. say mine because they're real fast. I did show up for, I did write every day. I did show up for office hours. Um, well, I think almost every day, but I did at least do the daily writing sprints. And um, that's how the next week is going to look too. I'll write every day and I know I'll be in office hours at least long enough to do the first daily sprint. I don't know what the rest of that is going to look like with hubby in town, um, but that's my goals. And so by the 11th, yeah, I need to be where Jen is. My um, Christmas story basically ready to turn in since that deadline is the 15th. So I will make my goal the 11th. I'll shoot for the moon and hopefully end up among the stars. What do you got for us for accountability, Bambina? Um, well, I'm still plugging away at um, editing and revising Lost. So I need to keep working on that every day. I went and bought these cute little tabs Ooh. and post-it notes. So I'm working hard at that. Um, and I need to, like you guys, I need to have my Christmas story ready to go. Um, mine is so much shorter than your guys's. And, uh, I'm, I wonder if I need to add stuff, but then at the same time, I feel like it's finished. So I'm not quite sure what to do about that. So I have to make some well, decisions. Well, that's why we're submitting in our finals in July. Like when we say finals, final for us all to look at it. You know what I mean? That's when like the critiquing starts, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll make it work. It, it could be, like you said, if it's done, it's done, you know? So yeah, I feel like if I added anything else, it would just be filler. Well, and Jen was saying that her scope was too big, perhaps mine is too, and mine is too long. So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're the one who's wrong. So we'll have to evaluate that after we turn those in. The Christmas stories for the city of Lapierre. Uh, Jen, we have two minutes. Anything going on in the chat of note? Anybody sharing their goals for the week? Um, no one has shared that yet. There's lots of uh, chat going on. Um, let's see. Gina says, um, ha, 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 ow. <laughs> uh, that was definitely directed at me. I know that was directed at me, but everyone's congratulating me on the on the book, and I really appreciate that. Um, but uh, oh, Rhonda says that her compilation portion is getting close to ten thousand, so hers is probably going to be the longest of all four bars. So, like like we said, and you got to write the story as the story is. Just write the story, and then we go back and we edit. Like that's with everything we do, right? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, get the story out the way you feel like it should be written, and then you walk away from it for a little bit, and then you come back and edit. So, um, Tina, can you add a B story? I don't know what that means. Like a part B, another, oh. or, you know, or whatever. Uh, Robin Sardi says her goal for next week is 10,000 words on her story. Ooh, big goal. Awesome. That's big you goal. can do it. You can do yep. it. Little and Maria says. Oh, and Maria says her goal is she's going to start Camp Nano next week. We didn't talk about Camp Nano no, at all. No, we but didn't. Well, we have we, a couple of minutes, maybe. Go for it. We, we are not doing Camp Nano as a team like we did for April. July is always too busy for all of us with vacations and kids and stuff. But um, Camp meeting. Yeah, camp meeting for, yeah, for, um, for Tina and I, our church camp meeting. Um, so, but we would love to hear you guys tweet us what you're doing. And I think, and we'll keep on um, keep um, tracking what you guys are doing. So that's very exciting. So glad to hear that Maria is going to be doing camp. Um, Gina says her goal is to write 5,000 more words this week between today and tomorrow. So Ooh. you go, Gina, you can do it for sure. And Robin's doing camp as well. So lots of camp nano stuff happening. So very exciting. Yeah, that is very exciting. Um, and again, no podcast from us. You won't see us the week of July 4th. Okay. So everybody just be looking forward to getting together with us again at 10 o'clock on the 11th. Um, where we will have a to-be-determined topic for you. But you can go get caught up with us, binge watch us on Patreon, 
uh, for only $2, you can get caught up with all of the Patreon um, episodes that we have posted. They're really good meat, meaty critiques to help you give and receive feedback and also some uh, extra special writing that the rest of the public has not seen. So if there's nothing left to say, I can sign off. How do you ladies feel about it? Sounds good. Okay. All right. That concludes this episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. So until next week, may your pen be prolific, may your deadlines be met, and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye now. Bye.